Hello, my name's Andrew Jeffrey. I'm a consultant chess physician in Northampton, and I've been asked to try and summarise in 10 minutes um, a practical approach to the patient being presented with acute severe asthma in A&E. So, here goes. Actually, this bit's going to be really fast because that's the way it feels when the patient comes in. You've been called to A&E, there's a patient who's got severe asthma, they're chucking everything at them, you're running into resus, you're getting a bit out of breath yourself, your pulse is going 180 minutes. But the most important thing, and if you remember nothing else from this video, please remember this. The best way you can help the patient is to stay calm. I don't care if your pulse is 180. On the outside, it should look like it's 60. It should look like you do this every day of the week. And if everyone else is running around, scurrying about, saying, oh God, we're going to this good, come on, come on, just tell them to go away and calm down. Your patient with asthma will be panic enough for 10 of you, and it makes it worse. You can't really assess them sensibly until you have a bit of calm and a few minutes. Two minutes will make no difference. You can do it that quickly. So you've got calm. You've put on your fake face. You're managing your tachycardia. What are you gonna do? First thing you're gonna do is assess them. Is this asthma? So many people I get called to see acute severe asthma, they don't have asthma. A young patient, yeah, it's likely to be that. We don't get that diagnosis wrong very often, but it may not be their asthma that's the problem. They could just be having a whole huge amount of panic. They may be having laryngospasm, vocal cord dysfunction, all sorts of things can look like terrible asthma without being so. You could assume it is terrible asthma in the first place. But have a good listen to the chest. Are they wheezy? Is the good air entry? Is all the wheeze actually coming from their throat? Do they look terrified? Well, actually, they all will be terrified. That's going to be part of the problem. So you need to just have a quick think around that. The older patient is slightly more difficult. So many people, it's asthma, COPD. Nobody tells the difference. Well, they're different diseases. If they've got severe wheeze, call it asthma for the moment because the treatments will work for both. But I always think, particularly in someone who's presenting, with new onset asthma in their late 60s, who had a myocardial infarct three years ago, could this actually be pulmonary edema? And that's why it's not responding to the asthma medications. So think about your diagnosis very carefully. And of course, any of your patients could have any combination of those things. You're not going to spend too long doing that because you need to get them treated. The peak flow, really helpful. Blank peak flow sheets, no one's actually said whether they've even tried to do it, really unhelpful to the later stages of treatment. Try to get them to do a peak flow. It may actually answer some of your questions as to what the problem is. But if they can't, please write down in the notes, peak flow unable. I want you to do a gas. Well, almost everyone gets a gas done, but they shouldn't have. There's lots and lots of evidence that having repeated blood gases when people come in with acute severe asthma prevents them coming in early because they're terrified of getting another one done. Those are the ones who die the ones who are terrified to come in. Every national and international guideline says do not do blood gases on someone with known asthma unless their oxygen saturation is less than 92%. Some say 94, the UK ones say 92%. That's irrespective of how much oxygen they're on. They could be on a reservoir mask. If it's over 92, don't do it because their CO2 will not be up. The sats fall first. Okay, what are you going to treat them with? Well, you're going to treat them with salbutamol. IV? Nebulized? Well, we always go for nebulized first, and that's absolutely right. There is no evidence of any benefit for IV unless the airway is obstructed. The patient cannot use it. Equally, if you've got someone with a tracheostomy, it may be difficult, you might not have the right mask available, perhaps then. But otherwise, no, nebulized. And please remember the half-life of um, salbutamol is a few hours. The speed of onset, most people don't know. It starts working within 30 seconds. Its peak effect is at 40 minutes. So if you're giving back-to-back -back nebulizers because the first one finishes, they're not better yet, you just stick another one on, and then each one takes 10 minutes. By the time you give them the third one, the first one is actually only just reaching peak. That's usually when you end up doing other things but you're far too early. If you give too much 
subutum, or you're going to end up with patients who've got lactic acidosis and hyperventilated because they're acidotic. You're going to have their pulse rate even higher. It's risky. What you really need to do is look, are they improving? If so, that's fine. If they're not improving, keep calm. I come back to it. Give them 15 minutes between nebulizers. If they're deteriorating, call for help. Ipatropium added, yes, certainly in acute severe asthma, that's quite important, but it only adds about 5% bronchodilatation. It's worth it in the early nebulizers, but please remember to take it off the list once the patient has started improving, because they just end up with a dry mouth and no particular benefit. Ipatropium, done that, sorry, magnesium. What's the role of magnesium? Well, the role of magnesium is to make the doctor feel better. That's my personal view. And if you look at the Cochrane reviews, it will show you there is no overall demonstrable benefit of certainly none for nebulized magnesium. For intravenous magnesium, if you look at a whole cohort, no benefit whatsoever, but no harm. We all believe that there are patients within that cohort who probably do get benefit, some who get none, and they're just cancelling each other out. But it's not a magical solution. It doesn't mean I've given the magnesium all will be well. Steroids. IV, oral. Why do we give IV rather than oral? Speed of onset of IV hydrocortisone, six hours. Speed of onset of oralprednisolone, six hours. No difference in benefit, but you give it IV, you know it's in there. You prescribe a tablet, they swallow it, they're sick. They don't swallow it. They don't absorb it. It's just really for the security of knowing that steroid is in. Dosage? Well, it's varied in my lifetime. You know, 30 milligrams for the smaller patient, 40 for the bigger, that's still what I work with. The national guidelines now say 40 to 50 milligrams for an initial dose. But if the patient's already had 40 milligrams of prednisolone that day, is there any advantage of giving them another 40? No. Shot of IV hydrocortisone, yes, because you know it's in. You're never sure if you weren't there whether they really took that steroid earlier on. But if they're already established in hospital when this all happens and you know they had the dose this morning, that extra steroid will make no difference at all. It'll just give side effects. The next thing you have to do is have a think about when to call for help. I've got a really simple answer to that. First time you think of it. If you think, I think I'm going to need help here, get it now, from your intensive care, your consultant, whoever might be around, but actually you do not want to delay because once a patient gets bad enough and they start tiring and they start desaturating, getting them on a ventilator becomes substantially more risky. You call for help when your gut, you first think, I need help. Let someone else work that out. Okay, so you've got over the panic bit. Your patient is just starting to improve. Everyone's breathing a little easier. What are you going to do now? Well, I'll tell you what most people do. They give antibiotics. Intravenous tazacin is the commonest one in our hospital. Is there any indication for antibiotics in a patient with an acute severe asthma attack? Simple answer is no, there is none. Every national and international guideline says do not give antibiotics and pretty well every doctor in the world gives them. Bacterial infections in general do not make asthma worse. I've seen people with bilateral pneumonia with asthma, their asthma was fine. Viral infections make asthma worse. You give antibiotics if you've got a good reason. They just had a sputum culture, yes, they did, it came back showing an organism. Or they've got a screamingly high CRP, not just a little bit up because the asthma will put it up a bit, but it's, you know, it's 200 or whatever. Their white count will go up with their asthma. So it's ideally it's a procalcitonin if you have access to that because it's a little bit more specific. If that was up, I would give it. That would mean you give it one in 20 exacerbations you ever see. It's not necessary. Please try not to give it. You need to make sure you're recording their peak flow. Once everything's calmed down, they're probably going to be able to do one, even if it's only comes out as 50. But you've got a starting point. We know what it was like when they came in. Helps us judge their progress as time goes on. You want to give regular nebulizers, four hourly, until such time as the patient has achieved near normal peak flows. 
Do you need to keep with the, the ipotropium in? No, personally, I take it out as soon as the peak flow is starting to improve. I'll wait to, to, for it to improve, but that's why you need the initial one. It is not a long-term solution. It does very little in asthma in general. The other thing you need to do is position your patient properly. And probably you should be doing this right at the beginning. Patients will adopt various positions. We'll put them in various positions. The best position to be in is upright, so that your diaphragm has less work to do moving your guts. Shoulders down. Every patient will end up with their shoulders up here because they're panicking. Shoulders down, hands in the lap, or elbows on the knees, just leaning slightly forward, as you can see in this position. That frees up the respiratory muscles to do their work without having to do other things. It can make a huge difference to the quality of their breathing. That will take down the angst. As the angst comes down, they start getting better. Okay, so we've now got a patient who is improving. You're continuing with your medications. Let's have a think about the nearly ready for home. Not quite, but nearly. This is the time you need to be looking at why the heck did they come in in the first place? You need to ask the questions. What is your control like normally? How often do you wake at night normally? Every night? They wake every night, it's not surprising their asthma went out of control completely. You want to see, do they actually take their medications? And be nice about it. Give them permission to say, actually, no, I only take it when I feel crap. Because many patients, and I'm included in this, miss doses. Life's like that. But if it becomes a habit that you're missing doses, you don't want to increase the dose of their inhaled steroid and discharge. You just want them to take the dose they were originally prescribed. You need then to think about what triggered it. Was it a specific allergen? Sometimes there are specific allergens we can desensitize people to. Or they just need to learn to avoid them. But it's worth exploring. Was it a viral trigger? That's probably the most common throughout the autumn and winter months. It's less common in the summer months. Or the one we tend to forget about completely, was it triggered by stress? Stress hormones increase inflammation. They increase the inflammation in asthma, they make asthma worse physically. Look, actually taking a proper history, what's going on in life, anything going on that might trigger it, you can find amazing things. You now got to the point where they're about to be discharged. What is it that indicates a safe discharge? They've got to have a good peak flow. It's not just because they can breathe and walk around the ward, and we see that all too often. If you want your patient to go home and stay home, they should have a peak flow, that's the best peak flow in the day, at least 75% of their best normal, if they don't know their best normal, go with the predicted. And the variability within the last 24 hours should be less than 25%. What's more, that should be achieved without a nebulizer, unless they're on regular nebulizers at home. That actually takes quite a long time to get there, but it's worth it because we reduce readmissions we reduce post-discharge morbidity. They get back to work and get back to life much quicker. Pre-discharge, we also need to check their inhaler technique, discuss an asthma plan and arrange follow-up. And in many organizations that will be done by a specialist asthma nurse. If you don't have one, it's up to you to do it. And then the thorny question, how long do they keep taking their steroids for? I have a very simple plan, which has worked well over the last 30 years. You continue full dose steroid until they are totally better. Their peak flow is back to normal, their function is back to normal, they feel normal. That's a very variable length of time. It can be up to 10 days post-discharge before they reach that point. And then you give them two or three days longer just to consolidate that before it's stopped. If they've had a total of less than three weeks and they haven't had steroids in the preceding three months, you can stop abruptly. If either of those two don't apply, you tail it off over a week. I tend to come down by about five milligrams a day, each day, and say, pause if your symptoms start coming back. And so long as they've got a follow-up, it should be within seven to 10 days post-discharge, that can then be discussed with whoever is going to follow them up. So that's a really rapid run through acute asthma. I think my main message is keep calm, think about what you need to do, and remember it's not all about the bronchospasm, it's about the whole way the patient and their their fear and everything else is building into the symptoms they're displaying.
acute severe asthma can resolve within about 48 hours. That's pretty rare. It can take three weeks. If it takes three weeks, please do not be tempted to discharge them too early because they'll just come back. And then you go through the whole thing again. And that is not in anyone's interest whatsoever. So I hope that's been helpful. You've got a few tips from that and good luck.